بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending him greetings and salutations upon the final Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam We find that the human being has been created with that which is known as shu'ur with feelings there are various feelings which have been placed inside the human body at times we find immense sadness at times we find immense happiness and some of these feelings are beyond our control that certain things could begin to take place upon the individual and they cannot control themselves that does not mean that they lose total focus upon the things that they have to do or they have to carry out because many average individuals in their immense happiness do many silly things and many individuals in their immense anger their rage or being upset also do silly things we find from the sunnah of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he was given that ability that whether in a state of immense happiness or sadness nothing came out of his blessed mouth except for revelation wama yantiqu anil hawa in huwa illa wahyun yuha everything he utters is nothing but divine revelation so thus we find that when the companions pose that question that should we write everything that comes out disseminates from your blessed mouth whether you're angry etc he said yes everything that comes out of my mouth is nothing but revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously whatever comes out from our mouths is far far away but if a person begins to follow that methodology in trying to control themselves in to develop those fine characteristics maybe glimpses of that may be developed within the individual and the reason why i mention this inside the introduction is because the title itself is something ambiguous it's not something very clear can we instill love within our children is it possible to purchase or buy love and to place it into the heart of the individual that is a key question that we need to begin our lives with there are certain things that we can control and certain things that we cannot control so the answer is partially true that times we can instill love and at times we don't have that ability to instill the love within the individual and we find that love is of various forms that you find ulama talk about the concept of the heart of the human being has various elements of love those various forms of love they don't contradict one another qadi iyad fudail ibn iyad mentions that you find hub lil khaliq love for the creator for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an immense form of love likewise you find after that love towards the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a different form of love love towards one's parents towards one's family members towards one's children etc one's wife it's all different elements of love the heart is able to contain and to you need develop upon that so the initial stage we need to understand about love towards our children and the people around us that at times it could be an element whereby that love there is no response of that love 
For example, the Quran mentions about those individuals in, on an average basis. You find that many, unfortunately, non-Muslims, there's a difficult element inside their life. The Quran mentions, فَلَا تُعْجِبْكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُهُمْ Don't let their wealth and their children startle you. Don't let that amaze you, the amount of children and the wealth that they possess upon this dunya. Because the wealth and the children for them, as the Quran mentions, a general characteristic. It doesn't mean that some of them will not rejoice with their children and the wealth, but the general perception is that these things have been given to them. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَتَزْهَقَ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them these things of the dunya لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ بِهَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا That the wealth and the children become a punishment, a chastisement for them in this world. وَتَزْهَقَ أَنفُسُهُمْ We take out their souls وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ They are in a state of disbelief. This is something for an individual to ponder upon. That children and wealth as the Quran mentions can, can become for the individual إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ أَجْرُ الْعَظِيمُ Indeed your children and your wealth become a fitna for you. So for many of the average individual we find their wealth and their children has become a trial or tribulation for those individuals. And just before the ayah we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدَّ لَكُمْ فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Or oh, you believe indeed your wealth and your children, your spouses, your family members are enemies towards you. فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Stay away from them. Now here we understand from this ayah inside the Quran إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ مِنْ From بِمَعْنَى in the Arabic language تَبْعِدِيَّ بَعْضُ Doesn't mean all of your children doesn't mean all of your family members, all of your wealth. Some may translate it min from no, but some. At times, your wealth and your children could become an element of a trial or tribulation upon you need the believer. If we go back to the previous verse in verse number 15, the answer is given. What is the Muslim parent's role? What is the Muslim's role upon this earth? فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا استطعتم. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you can. That's the key element. And we begin to understand that this is this ayah in the Quran has also become a principle in the soul al fiqh. That the person carries out the actions which they have the ability to do so and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as they can. Unfortunately, for some of us that love becomes a spoiled love. The love that we have towards our children, it may begin to taint our perception of what we want to gain from them. Once again, the Quran touches upon this as well. يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُلْهِكُمْ أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ Or you believe, don't let your wealth and your children become a distraction for you. Distract you away from the dhikr of Allah. Indeed, those individuals who let their wealth and their children distract them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ those are the, the losing individuals. So Muslim is weary that our wealth and our children don't take us away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we know once again that emotional feeling of love that some parents will try to give everything to their children even if it means to open up to the world of muharramat, of haram things. As many parents we discuss with them, they say living inside this environment, there's no harm in giving them access to certain things or giving them the ability, the rationale to choose and to make a choice what's halal, what's haram. So if they indulge in doing something haram, then they will discover themselves what is the right thing to do. This is a dangerous perception because a child doesn't have the ability like an adult or a person who's got tajriba experience of their life. So this is a weak element for a parent to think, I allow my child to have something which may be impermissible or haram or let them experiment and eventually find that which is the right thing to do. So we as Muslim parents should be vigilant about trying to open up the doors of letting our children to experiment with certain things and then they themselves discover that which is right or that which is wrong. Likewise, we find 
that this distraction of the Quran mentions, eight categories of individuals we mentions on Surah at Tawbah, that if we begin to love them to such a degree, and they begin to distract us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. Qul in kana aba'ukum wa abna'ukum. Say indeed, if your, your parents and your children and your family members, your wealth, your dwellings, your property, all of this, ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi fatarabbasu hatta yati Allahu bi amri. Wait, and if you feel that these categories, these eight categories, are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger and striving and struggling inside his path, then wait until the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not guide the rebellious individuals. So this is a warning for the Muslim that our emotional feeling is on a balance of understanding that the context of what we follow inside our life is following the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Muslim parent begins to understand إِنَّكَ لَا تَحْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ You cannot guide any whom you love. Indeed, it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one that guides. لَيْسَ عَلَيْكَ هُدَاهُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ It's not upon you to guide. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whomever He wants. So we should be wary because many of our parents, when we work with them, they think that every time we teach them that they should become the pious individuals, the rightly guided individuals or excelling to such a degree that we find it. it may be unfortunately not possibly true that every single child will respond in a responsive manner. And that's the Quran once again documents upon this. You find the whole story, the theme of Nuh salam, whereby the Quran documents the story of Nuh salam, whereby his son does not believe. وَنَادَ نُوحُ رَبَّهُ فَقَالَ رَبِّي إِنَّ بْنِي مِنْ أَهْلِي Indeed, Nuh salam, he called out to his Lord, O oh my Lord, indeed, my son is from my lineage. He is from my genealogy. And indeed, your promise is true that you should rescue him alongside with myself. Indeed, you are the best of judges. What was the response given? That's documented inside the Quran. Qala ya Nuh, innahu laysa min ahlika, innahu amalun ghayru salih. A new terminology is given inside the Quran. The word normal meaning of ahl is your blood relationship. People are related to you. But the Quran says, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ This son of yours is no longer your family member. إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحِ His actions are null and void. Impious actions. No longer call him your son. So this is a prophet of Allah, Nuh as we find who is the first messenger. His son refuses to listen to him, to believe. And likewise, even the opposite is mentioned. Ibrahim السلام, is the believing son and his father is what? He's a disbeliever. The lessons that we learn from this, that guidance is not in the hand or the control of the human being. If this happened to the Anbiya, then what will happen to the average individual? But we can take extracts from this to begin to strengthen and to work towards uh, encouraging or nourishing or trying to teach our parents and the children around us. Likewise, you find Luqman, the 31st chapter of the Quran, the most of this surah is all talking about tarbiyah. If you want to go back and learn tarbiyah to awlad fil Islam, how to bring up your children, nurture your children, how to deal with them, you find it documented inside surah Luqman. Likewise, surah Al-Hujarat, the 49th chapter of the Quran, these 18 ayat inside surah Al-Hujarat, because many people, they always want to know how do you develop an Islamic society. What policies or what do you need to do? Ulama have mentioned these 18 ayat inside Surah Al-Hujurat, the 49th chapter of the Quran. If we can implement and live via these 18 ayat, we will once again create the Islamic identity and the Islamic environment once again. So Luqman, speaking to his son, Ya Bunayya, speaking, admonishing his son, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ Ya Bunayya la tushrik billah inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Luqman speaking to his son, giving him admonition, giving him advice. Oh my son, don't commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you read through the rest of the ayat, you find some excellent piece of advice which he's giving to his son. But we can begin to extract what we need to begin to teach our children inside their life. The ayat that he begins to mention was mentioned in the Quran. Ya Bunayya, aqimish salah. Oh my son, begin to establish the prayer. 
So after belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first lesson that needs to be instilled within the child is the establishment of the prayer. وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Order the good and forbid the evil. وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكَ Have patience upon whatever calamities befall or come upon you. إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Indeed, that is from the lofty uh, devotion or lofty commitment of the individual. Whoever establishes their prayer, believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, orders the good and forbids the evil, has patience upon the difficulties that come or befall upon the individual. Then comes the characteristics. Because some of our children, they may learn these characteristics. But when it comes to the finer characteristics of behavior of adab that we find, we haven't taught them these characteristics. Luqman, he teaches his son, he mentions him, وَلَا تُسَعِرْ خَيْرِ nas. Don't stretch out your, your neck. The sa'ir that you find ulama mentioned, Lugha is a disease in the neck of the camel. Don't be stubborn, don't be arrogant towards the people around you. وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا Don't walk upon the earth in a state of pride, in a state of arrogance. So here you find, but teaching his son, don't be arrogant towards the people around you. Don't think you're something special above them. And likewise, don't walk upon the earth in a state of arrogance and pride. Inna Allah la yuhibbu kulla mukhtalin fakhur. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like any rebellious, boastful individual. Waqsid fi mashika. When you walk upon the earth, walk in a state of tranquility and peace and contentment. Waqdud min sawtika. And be humble, lower your voice in your speech. You speak to one another, lower your voice. Because indeed we find in the Ankara al Aswati la sawtul hamir. Indeed, the most wretched of voices is the braying of the ass, the sound of the donkey. These are all adab that the Quran is teaching us how we teach our children how to conduct, how to behave, how to walk, how to talk. Which at times some of us Muslim parents or Muslim teachers, we don't seem to instill these practical teachings within our children, unfortunately. Likewise, we find that we find that natural love is there that a child or the parent has towards the child. Every single Muslim, as we know, the Quran mentions the opposite to the non muslim that we mentioned, that their children become a form or a source of punishment or torture for them upon this earth. As for the believers, Al Malu wal Banun, Zinatul Hayatid Dunya. Wealth and children are the beautiful things of this dunya. That's what most individuals they aspire to have the wealth and the children. So obviously this is something which is halal if the person uses it in the correct manner. The Quran mentions this great blessing. We've bestowed upon you the blessings of wealth and banin and children. Indeed, we have made you numerous in manpower and number. Till eventually the children they become, as the Quran mentions, the supplication of Ibadur Rahman. The supplication of servants of Ar-Rahman mentioned towards the end of Surah Al-Furqan وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا Servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala walk upon the earth in a state of tranquility, in a state of peace. Till eventually the dua is mentioned وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنْ وَجَعَنَّا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا The pious individuals, their supplication is Make from amongst our spouses and our children the coolness, the tenderness of our eyes and make us to be, become amongst those individuals, the pious individuals, leaders for the people around us. So thus it becomes incumbent upon us because sometimes we're focusing upon so many different things and sometimes it's easy to focus upon the world around us and to lose focus upon the people who should be close to us. The Quran mentions that sort of tahrim the 66th chapter of the Quran Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara Oh you believe, save yourselves and your family members from the hellfire Not to say that we shouldn't be worried about anything else but the real cause for a Muslim is is worrying about oneself and their family members Some of us Muslims we lose focus upon that that we think it is not very very important to save oneself and one's family members. There are other tasks that we need to carry out inside our life. And this could be, may Allah forbid, a deception any of the devil.
Talbis Iblis, deception devil, it becomes easy for a person to focus upon other things and not focus upon those direct subjects which happen to be underneath them. Likewise, you find that Islam encourages the concept of rahmah, of mercy, of compassion. Man la yarham la yurham. Whoever doesn't show mercy will not be given any mercy. So this is the characteristic of the parents. That parent understands that relationship towards the child, one way of insight is to show compassion, mercy and concern. Because we know in general how our culture creates a big divide between the father and the son. There's hardly any relationship. There's hard, hardly any love. Many of us, we grow up feeling hatred, animosity, a, a lack of conviction or relationship with our parents because we've just drifted away. It always seems to be just commandments which are given to the child or given you need to the son, etc. So we find that mercy, compassion, in everything in our life, we try to go back to the sunnah. But how about in these practical steps which have been mentioned in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu whereby we find in a famous hadith in Bukhari that one day he kissed Al-Hasan so and in the companion by the name of Al-Aqra he said indeed I have 10 children I have 10 children I've never kissed them in my life so how did the Prophet Muhammad respond to this individual indeed mercy has been snatched away from your heart there's no element of mercy and compassion inside your heart if you cannot show any love and emotion and devotion towards your own children. Like you find famous hadith in Bukhari again of Aisha whereby she visualizes a, a mother with the two children. She has three dates. She gives one date each to each child and she's left with one date. Before she can begin to eat her own date, the children have finished their date. So what does she do? She breaks her own date in half and gives a half to each of the two children again. That's mercy. That's compassion. That's love. That's feeling that we as parents need to develop once again towards any our children via the practical implementation of the sunnah and the life of the Prophet Muhammad There are certain elements that we need to begin to train or work with our children to begin to develop, to create that love, to create that commitment. Obviously, some of them were quite clear about what we need to do inside our lives. Amongst the commitments we find is Rabdul Itiqadi, is the link of belief that we find Mas'uliya to Tarbiya al Imaniya, to nurture our children upon the right Iman. To this day, many of us have come to the Western world, living in the 21st century. Unfortunately, many of our parents or some members of our society still have cultural beliefs superstitious beliefs myths fables folklores tales etc exist on a wide scale inside our community if you want to change the vision of the future as they say then you need to go back to the grassroots and begin by instilling the right orthodox beliefs within our children how many of our parents grew up inside this community and we compromised some of us very rarely expressed our faith or expressed our concerns. We need to teach our children the right creed, the right belief, the love of Iman. Teach that within them that there is, if you want to be somebody special, you need to hold fast to this creed and to this belief. With this comes along a Rabtul Ruhi, the spiritual needs of creating the atmosphere for our children. How many of us grew up whereby you find that there was no access to a masjid? There was, you were not allowed to even possibly breathe appropriately inside the masjid. That if you did cough or you did laugh, then, excuse the expression, all hell would break out loose. And then we tried to instill within them, have devotion, have ibadah, have worship. So sometimes we need to go back to the drawing board and reassess ourselves. That what are we actually creating? After 30, 40 years, we can see. And it may sound very strange. There are some children inside our society who don't ever want to step foot back into a masjid. Think about that. That's something very serious for us to think about. Children that have been taught previously, when they grow up, never ever want to return back to the masjid. I've taught adults, basic how to read the Quran, who said that they once they learned the Quran, they couldn't be bothered to read the Quran ever again in their life. That literally some of them may even been tortured in the masjid. And that made them never ever 
back to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever again and ever pick up the Quran. To whom does that blame return? Or maybe some of us parents that we've beaten our children black and blue in reading the Quran or doing certain actions. And the long-term detrimental effect is psychologically disturb these individuals. Who will pick up those pieces for that? So we have to begin to go back and work on ways of developing ibadah, relationship with the Quran, relationship with dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with nawafil, create with them and help them to instill the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over them, vigilant over them. How are all these elements going to take place? This deserves a long analysis and study of our lives and what we're doing inside this society to go back and to offer posi positive steps of changing the environment around us. The third thing that we find fikri, is the link of our thought, our perception that many of the average Muslim just sees Islam as a cultural practice, a cultural way of life. We have to instill within our children the thought, the perception that Islam was for the past, the present and the future. Read through our history of who we were, what we became and what we are today. That's all part of creating the personality of the individual. So many of our young individuals, they just know certain elements of us being Muslims. As for the global impact of Islam or the message of Islam that we find, many of them are aloof, far away from that. Nobody ever teaches them the real history, the background, the contribution of Muslims upon the society and the wider world around us. So they all just think, it's just textbook. There's no real Islam. There's no empire of Islam. There never was. Maybe some of us are not skilled enough to teach them about the history of Islam and the impact of Islam what existed before. The fourth rub, the fourth link that we need to develop in our lives is Rabtul Ijtima'i. The social link inside our society. Some of our students, some of our children are not able to engage inside society. Some of them even graduated from Islamic institutes. When they come out into society, cannot even construct a single appropriate sentence in the English language. Something to think about. We're living inside this environment. We're not able to engage inside, this, inside the society. The years of study, the years of practice. What, what is the benefit? Or we begin to ridicule one another, not able to tolerate one another, not able to speak with one another, not able to live with one another. The Quran teaches us, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ Indeed, believers towards one another are brethren. So the concept of living as a social creature, which is an element of the human being, to be able to engage with one another. Likewise, when the Quran tells us, Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. The most noble of you in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are whom? The pious individuals. That's where nobility and rank belongs. So this social element at times is also missing amongst many of us parents and many of the children in it as well. Fourthly, we find Arabtu riyadi is the link of physical fitness. We have to bring all these elements together to create the ideal, even though there is no ideal, but linguistically the ideal identity of keeping our children physically fit. Some of us, we think it's haram to run, to jog, to swim, or to be engaged in some form of combat, sport, or whatever it may be. That's what some Muslims, they think. They think it's just, it's haram. How is it haram if you go back to the prophetic traditions to, to swim, to run, to race, to wrestle, to learn how to throw an arrow, to throw a spear, etc., to ride a horse. These are all prophetic traditions which hardly exist inside our society. Even though it's been prophesied in the hadith of Bukhari from amongst the minors on the day of judgment will be what? Obesity. Obesity will become rampant in the world in the Muslim ummah. And some of our children are heading in that direction. There's no element of physical fitness. The completion of a human being is completion of all these five elements. Your faith, your creed, your character, your behavior, your spirituality, and your ability to keep yourself in a wholesome physical any fitness. The Quran mentions, Prepare for them all elements of warfare. What does that mean? All elements, quwa. Quwa doesn't just mean certain elements that we think. It means socially, it means financially, it means mentally, it means physically, it means spiritually. It means everything the human being is strengthening themselves. So we have to create those avenues. If not, what happens to many of our children? One way that you find they begin to go away is these uh, physical activities. 
that they begin to look up to those individuals as their role models, as people who are people who may be you know, cool individuals or good individuals. They can relate to them because we are not creating that avenue or that feeling inside the masjid or the community. We have many masajid. We need to go to a different dimension. That the masjid needs to be a social element whereby people can come and contain their faith and to enjoy themselves in a good halal manner without turning to the alternatives, the haram alternatives that we find around us. Likewise, we find it is a comp uh, combination and implementation, all these elements that will bring the individual to become the complete Islamic unique personality inside you need this society, which unfortunately many of us Muslims are not carrying out you need inside our lives, even though we have many facilities that Alhamdulillah Allah has blessed us with, especially living in, inside the West. Also, we find many of us, we want to leave the task to other individuals. An average parent always, in general, wants to pay someone else to become their tutor, to become their teacher, to become their friend, to become whatever it may be. Yes, there's certain things you may need to pay. But as we began with money, can't buy love. Money can't buy relationship. Money can't buy understanding. Money can't buy affection. So these are things that many of our parents or the parents around us are missing. They think it's just quite simply just do this and this will resolve you need the problem. Love has to be shown. Love has to be gained. Love cannot be something which is purchased. So we need to change our approach. As the Quran mentions, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will never change the condition of a people until they don't change their own condition. So just like we change everything about our lives when we came to this community, some of us may have had corrupt aqaid, corrupt beliefs, corrupt practices, corrupt lifestyle, whatever, we change it. Just like we change in everything in those things, we need to change in our approach towards our children and the people around us. Not everything in the Western world is haram or forbidden or something we should be looked down upon. Al-Hikmah, Dalatul Mu'min. Wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Even though this is not a hadith, many ulama rejected it as being a hadith. It's only a wise, a good statement or going back to possibly to one of the companions. So wisdom is the lost property of the believer. And whenever the believer finds it, has the most right to take that property back. That's what a Muslim is. The Muslim is always searching of avenues of wisdom, of gaining and collecting that wisdom and taking it back into their own life. Likewise, you find the use of language. If you read through some of the, the books of non-Muslims, of pedagogy, of raising children, of nurturing, of family, of environment, you know, you find some strange things inside there. You know, our life just becomes, we don't use imagination or humor or patience and playfulness. These are all prophetic actions. We find our life becomes commanding al-amr, al-zajr, warning, al-nahi, any prohibition, telling off. That's how we, we, we interact with our children at times. You just tell them off. And it, rather than telling them, there's other ways of saying, of trying to change the atmosphere, changing the avenue, changing their thought to distract them. Any how many times have we as parents ever sat down and spoken to our children, had a, as they say, a one-to-one -one discussion, what they like, what they dislike, maybe something's on their mind, emotional feelings that we find a child is growing up, going through adolescence, going through puberty. What do many parents do? Just any, but then shaitan or the under agya, do you understand? Devils come inside them, look at the way they're behaving. That's it. That's our thought, isn't it? Don't seem to understand these pressures that the person is going through in their life, the peer pressure of the whole community around them, their friends around them, their bodily change. So they will go and speak to whom? Speak to a non-Muslim, speak to someone else, confine in them, discuss with them. No, they should be coming whom directly? To the mother, coming to the father. Doesn't mean that there's be a total free relationship that they're able to discuss whatever or whatever it may be, but there's an element of trust that's been built that the child feels safe to return back to the father and the mother to be able to speak any you know, with them. Likewise, you find some of our parents, unfortunately, we are contradictory in our words and our practice. We're very vigilant of trying to send them to an Islamic environment, to Islamic school, and whatever it may be. But sometimes in our own home, in our own words and our own practice, we don't live up to that. And children are very smart, are very quick to see discrepancies. And somebody will even say bluntly, you tell us to do this, you don't do it yourself. You tell me to read the Quran, I never say you read the Quran in your life. You tell me to do uh, Qiyam or read extra prayers, I don't see you doing it. I don't see you making dhikr. You tell me not to lie, but on the phone you're lying all day long. 
You told me not to swear, you're swearing yourself. You told me not to cheat, you're cheating in your business. So this contradictory behavior, and it sounds strange, but it is true. This has a big impact upon our children because they are thinking that my father or my mother tells me something, but they don't do it in their own life. So it's not something so important at the end of the day. Likewise, we find that many of our children, unfortunately, have become orphans. What does that mean they become orphans? Are our children orphans? No, they're not. Materialistically, our children are well off than what many of us were when we were growing up. In it, today you find children are not even born and their parents are buying them the latest Nike TN, 135, 140 pounds. Buying them before they're even born and storing them away. And all the children, most of you ask the children, all of them, I'm sure they've got all the Nintendo DS, Lite and 3D and PS this and Vita and everything. We will give it to them. But our children are still what? They're orphans. Why are they orphans? As the Arab poet, he mentioned lines of poetry, لَيْسَ الْجَمَالُ بِأَثْوَابٍ تُزَيِّنُنَا Jamal, beauty, isn't the fine clothing that we wear, that we think this is beauty, this is luxury. بَلِ الْجَمَالُ جَمَالُ الْعِلْمِ وَالْأَدَبِ Real beauty is the beauty of knowledge and etiquettes and behavior. لَيْسَ الْيَتِيمُ الَّذِي قَدْ مَاتَ وَالِدُهُ The yatim isn't the one whose father has passed away. That's not an orphan individual that their father is no longer living. بَلِ الْيَتِيمُ الْعِلْمِ وَالْأَدَبِ The yatim child, the orphan child is the one who has no adab and has no ilm. That's what you call an orphan in the, in, in, in the world of upbringing of children. Has no one to nurture and to teach them. And many of our children, unfortunately, have become orphans in that respect, in terms of their knowledge and in terms of their etiquette and their behavior. The Quran tells us, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Warn whom? The close family members towards you. That is the role that we need to begin to instill within ourselves that will create the Islamic society once again. All of you are a shepherd. All of us. It comes a stage in our life of Allah death that we get married, we have children, we come to that level whereby we become responsible. Who are we responsible for? Each one of us is responsible for our flock. The flock which is underneath us. And each one of us will be asked about that. That's what we need to go back and program once again within our parents. We want to create that love within our children is show the element of responsibility. Don't show what our parents, and they had a justified excuse. They had a difficult life. They came here with hardly any money, with difficulties. So they had to work possibly many shifts, many hours, many days. But many of us are living a good life. But yet still we're being negligent towards our children in showing love and devotion you need towards them. And this struggle is a struggle a person needs to persevere, not lose hope and focus. Just like in the dunya, we don't lose hope and focus, we persevere with the challenges, we continue what we're doing. Likewise, in these challenges, instilling this love and this relationship towards our children, a person needs to persevere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never let the iman of an individual go to waste. So if you have that feeling in your heart, in your mind, your children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never let that go to waste. Yes, there may be, as we began with some children who may begin to uh, go astray, etc. But we find the parable is given inside the Quran that a good land will give out a good plantation, will give out good fruit, good vegetation. A corrupt land, a corrupt soil will only give out that which is rotten, that which is the weeds that we find around us. So we need to go back in instilling the appropriate land Sincere effort and struggle. There's various types of jihad that we find. The, one of the most ultimate levels of jihad living inside this country is what? Is bringing up our children. It's not a week struggle or a month struggle. It is a daily struggle. Every single day, a good parent is struggling throughout the day, throughout the night, in trying to be vigilant, in trying to give the children the right nourishment, the right treatment, the right environment inside their lives. And thus we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let that effort or that struggle go to waste. As that ayah inside the Quran that we find, رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Our Lord make amongst our children and our spouses that which will be the coolness of our eyes. Ulama tafasir mentioned the coolness of the eyes doesn't necessarily mean inside the akhirah. 
in the hereafter. It also means inside this dunya. You see your children upon righteousness, upon good actions, of good etiquettes, good behavior. That makes the parent feel, rejoices them. It makes them happy, makes them content. Unfortunately, some of our parents, they only want to see what? They want to see the success of the dunya of the children. That's how some of us have been programmed that we, we, we boast about their degrees, we boast about their careers, we boast about their money. I'm not saying we shouldn't boast about that. But we've taken it to such a precedence, that's all that we care about. All that discussion becomes that my son has a degree, my daughter has a degree, he's this, he's that, she's this, she's that. But what about their character? What about their behavior? What about their iman? What about their spirituality? Does it exist? On average, Allah knows best, it doesn't exist inside our community. Thus we have to go back and reprogram ourselves. We want the good in this dunya is via our children. We want the good inside the akhirah is via our children as well. Thus we find the son of Adam if he dies, everything comes to a standstill except for three. Amongst those three things that will benefit every single one of us will be a righteous son or a righteous daughter, a righteous child that prays for one's parents. That's the real success. That imagine each one of us, we leave this dunya. All of us are going to leave. And who will pray for us? Who will give that benefit to us when we've left this dunya? Will be the righteous children. So we exert our efforts to take the love and the feelings that we have for our children to begin to project that love in positive steps in trying to help them to change and to nourish them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove or change those negative elements that we have inside our society to make it to become something positive and wholesome. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq and ability to become good teachers, good practitioners, good parents towards firstly, towards our own children that we become the role model for them and our role modeling is only based upon whom? the best teacher, none other being the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed for us to emulate and to copy him and to learn from his life and to extract those fawaid will be the best task for us to develop inside our life, to have success inside this dunya and even more so inside the akhirah وَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِجَمِيعِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فَاسْتَغْفِرُ إِنَّهُ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ بَارَكُ اللَّهُ فِيكُمْ غُرَبًا